Hey, sports fans, it's Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. This is our program, uh, Socialing the Distance. We're with Jarrett Eaton, the 2016-2018 U.S. champ, and also the silver medalist from the 2018 World Indoors. Jarrett, great to see you. Great to be having you. Thank you. I uh, just appreciate this so much. Oh, no problem. So yeah. you're, you just told us off air that you've changed coaches. You're in Tucson or Phoenix? Phoenix, Arizona, yeah. Now, uh, so tell us a little about the, the arrangement. Who's coaching you now? Yeah, a uh, great guy named Tim O'Neill. Um, he's had success here with previous uh, athletes. Freddie Crittenton. Oh, yeah. Person, like, he trains down here with me. Cool. <clears throat> kind of gave me the a green light to come down. It's like, yeah, we're having a lot of fun. We're doing some great things down here. And, uh, you know, came out here and I fell in love. Awesome. Awesome. Now, I recall from a few years ago, were you teaching school? Yes, or I was a substitute high school teacher. Yeah. Wow. And where was that? That was in South Carolina, in Columbia, South Carolina. Okay. Yeah. And then you got a sponsor, correct? Sponsor, no sponsor, no. No sponsor? Okay. <laughs> so you moved down here on your own. On my own, yeah. Wow, wow. Um, what do you do? You like being in? How's Phoenix been for you? How's the training going? Uh, first thing was hot. Uh, well, kind of getting used to this hundred degree plus weather, you know, daily. Yeah, uh, that's the norm. I'm not. I'm not used to that. But the good thing is, it's different heat. You know, coming from humidity at Columbia. Sure. Uh, to my heat, so it's been it's been great there. Um, and then the training has been phenomenal. Um, I'm really, you know, falling in love with the concepts and some of the ideas that the coaches have, that the coach has and the culture and the teammates that I'm with is something that's, I haven't felt this since I was in college. So I think it's that's just awesome. environmentally wise and just, you know, being led by a fantastic coach. In 2020, you had, you had a few competitions indoors. Yeah. Uh, we were talking a little bit offline about Mondeville and then also Torun. And yeah. then you had the U.S. indoor champs, and that was the end of it, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and COVID happened. So, uh, talk to me about what your first um, feelings were when COVID hit. What? How did it change things for you? Ah, oh, man, I think initial thoughts were like safety first. So no one kind of knew what this was, and I think we we're trying to be overly cautious, which I think probably the right idea. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we we're kind of just rolling with the punches. Um, we kind of went into just training mode and kind of hopes that, you know, fill this out and see what's going to happen and develop. But um, things didn't really pan out for the outdoor season, but I think it was just a good mindset to just be, you know, flexible and roll with the punches. That's all you really can do. So, What is the biggest lesson you've learned so far in your new coaching relationship? Oh, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I've learned so far um, – is that, gosh, there's a couple of things. One is just being reinforced that like the small things matter so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Taking care of your body, making sure you're hydrated, eating well, sleeping well, you know, trying to eliminate all the stress throughout the day. Um, you know, just kind of winning the day victory type deal. So it sure falls on itself. Um, and just, um, I think the, environment that he has right now with this group mm -hmm. uh, making sure that we all push each other um and and when it's competition time when we're you know racing against our, each other um then it's competition time so i think i've learned to turn it on and turn it off with that coach if it makes sense cool you know? yeah yeah um what's a typical training day like uh training day is you know we'll roll in early because trying to beat the heat yeah uh, we'll warm up uh depending what the day calls for like today we had um three p 200 so we'll just warm up you know it's a light hearted warm up everybody's joking and you know having fun and trying to keep it high spirits yeah uh, then once we get on that line it's kind of down to business and then uh competition not competition but the encouragement and just the uh like we're out here to do a job oh sorry about that um okay. comes on and uh, we're focused and getting it done. And then afterwards, we're joking and having fun again. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice little dynamic that we got. Do you do much core work? Yes. So I'll do, we do core um, sometimes after practice, but I'm back at the house doing, you know, little things here and there. And I do yoga. Mm -hmm. So I think the core is one of the most, one of the underrated aspects of our body. So 
Um, <clears throat> when you were a college athlete, there were obviously changes from um, being a high school athlete. Tell us a little bit about what you were like as a high school athlete. Man, as a high school athlete, um, I was definitely, um, gosh, I don't think I was looking to be a professional track and field athlete. I was still okay. playing football at the time. Mm -hmm. Track and field was something that I did with my friends. Um, mm -hmm had a great, you know, core friend group in high school and we ran track, we were fast, you know, we're just having fun. Um, and even the practices back then, our coach really tried to kill us. Um, <laughs> he was an old school, you know, 80s, 70s guy, and he believed in repeat 400s and everybody was a quarter miler. And, and um, I really gained a lot of strength from doing those workouts, but um, I didn't really think that I would be a professional track athlete, let alone run in college like I did. Um, my main focus was football and I kind of excelled at track on, in the background. When you went to Syracuse, did you play football as well? No, I did not. Um, I made the decision when I was going to transfer schools from Westchester University to Syracuse University. I said that I'm going to focus on one sport and one sport only. Um, I had the opportunity to do both. I really wanted to go to a Division One institution and track and field offered me that advantage, uh, you know, what I wanted. And I said, that I'm going to commit, you know. What, uh, when did you know so. that the hurdles was your event? Um, back in eighth grade, seventh grade, when everyone was scared to do it. Um, <laughs> our first interaction, our coach was really great. He introduced us to all the events and no one really wanted to do the hurdles. So I was like, I'm brave. I'm strong. You know, I'm, I'm different. I'm cool. And, um, I think there was a couple other people who did it with me and I ran over the hurdles and they fell and I was like, you know, I didn't fall. So this is kind of my thing now. So, <laughs> yeah. What is the key to being a good hurdler? Um, I, the key to being a good hurdler, I think, um, is mentally knowing that, like, oh gosh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I'd say mentally is not getting stuck up on those bad practices. Mm -hmm. uh, with the hurdles, it's a rhythmic race, so you're going to be off rhythmically as long as you're getting these, um, practices in this experience, I think that you'll be a, a, a great hurdler and understanding the rhythm of the hurdles at that. When I've watched you compete, um, you seem to get better in the rounds. Um, yeah. What is it about that type of competition that allows you to pull your best? Um, I don't know. I, I realized that I am a really high stakes competitor. So when it's, you know, one round or, you know, I, I find it hard to kind of get my body to go. Um, and I love the competitions. I love the championships feelings. And I just get really uh, energized throughout the rounds. And I think a lot of that comes from just being in good shape. Um, and then also having a little bit of wisdom behind me to know that, you know, I don't have to kill myself this first round. I can do what I need to to get through. And I know and I trust myself that um, I can turn it on when it's needed, just like that. So, yeah. When you first competed against Harry's Merritt, um, did you freak out? Yeah. Not only just Harry's Merritt, it's, you know, David Oliver, Terrence sure. Trudeau. Uh, yeah, you've been with all the guys. Yeah, the, the, that whole generation. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, these guys are, I mean, you watch them as you're in high school. Like, gosh, these guys are killing it out here. You know, the yeah. world record, the, you know, the best in the world, world champion, Olympic champion. It's just name the list. And going out there, you're just trying to do your best to keep up with those guys. I don't think in the back of my mind, you you know you're going to lose if you're just trying to keep as close to them as possible. Maybe give them a little bit of, of a scare, you know, in the middle of the race, mm -hmm. uh, but kind of make them recognize you. I think that was my first thought was like, I want to be recognized by these people. Um, and if they can recognize me in a race, I think I've done a good job. So that's. When you've been in Europe, you've competed against the likes of Orlando Ortega, um, Shubenko, Sergei Shubenko. Um, have you, when you guys are off the track, 
is there a camaraderie among the hurdlers? Yeah, you know what? I think it's a lot different than the sprinters. I think it's a lot of ego, a lot of machismo, you know. But the hurdlers were all laid back, cool kind of guys. Like we'll be laughing and kicking it after, you know, the event is done. Um, and I think I call some of these competitors my actual friends. Um, and it's with the hurdles, I think that's really unique. I don't. Yeah. I don't know a lot of other sprinters that are like the hurdlers. You know, we're a little different breed, so. I remember sitting down with Aries and a couple of other hurdlers. This has got to be 2012 or 13. And I said, what makes hurdlers so tough? And um, the silver medalist Richardson, I think, said, we compete against each other several times a week. And we, we don't, we're, we're, we compete against the best all the time. Yeah. Is that part of what makes it such a tough event? Yeah, and I think you can see it across not only guys' event, but the, the female hurdlers. They are, yeah. you know, just as tough. We're out there fighting each other every week. And mm -hmm. some of the sprinters, they'll dodge each other. You know, maybe I'll see you, you know, once a month, some real good competition. Um, but we don't have the ego that they do. And so if you take one on the chin, you know, it's like, let's get back at it. And I think that just falls into the rhythm work. Like, you could have a bad race but still have the confidence that, you know, I've got the rhythm to be a lot better this next week. You know, I can fix that one thing. Um, and you just roll with the punches and continue on. And also it, it keeps you to be a little bit of a, a humble person too. Um, you know, you can have a good streak where you're, you know, you're rolling, but you know, shoot, somebody could have a just as good a day as you and it'll be right down to the wire. So what, uh, how do you prepare yourself mentally for a U.S. championship? Because there's obviously so much on the line. And when you line up with eight guys in a semi, yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, probably eight of the 12 best in the world. You know, um, how do you prepare yourself for a situation such as that? Yeah, well, I think it just falls back on practice. Um, we have to realize that, like, practice, we're in these simulations to make it as tough as possible. And then when we get to this competition at USA's, we're trying not to make it as more, I'm trying not to make it more special than it is. So mm -hmm. I want it to feel like it's practice, you know, and I've got a great group of guys here that I can laugh and joke with and kind of have that same lighthearted playfulness before the event. And then, you know, when it's time to go, it's time to go. And it, and we train for that. So it shouldn't feel foreign to us as we, you know, step into the, to, to the USA championships. In 2019, you took a bronze on the four by one team in uh, at the Pan Am Games. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was bizarre. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it was literally um, guy after guy was just getting hurt. It was after USA's, and they were running out of bodies. And it was just like, shoot, like anybody can fit this large jersey. I was like, well, I'm available, so <laughs> why not? And I thought that you know I'd be fast enough to have these guys get a medal and you know they trusted me you know on their four by one uh, i remember talking to mike rogers and uh, bryce robinson they're like yeah man like you can do it i, I trust in you I'm, I'm glad to have you here because literally i don't think there would have been any other person uh -huh. literally last guy standing so wow. <laughs> you know first leg and was able to hold my own you know throughout that that first half and then you know handed off the baton and i thought i did fairly well um and then we got bronze. Yeah, it was kind of a kind of a weird opportunity that I got. So, <laughs> what's it uh, like uh, racing with Mike Rogers? Oh, it's fun, man. It's just watching him do his thing. I think anybody who makes the sport look easy is spectacular to watch. So, yeah. you know, I'm thinking, you know, he makes it look so easy that I could, you know, run with him. But I'm taking starts with him, and my head is popping up the first two steps because I got a hurdle in my face usually. And yeah keeping his head down and by the time I know it he's 40 yards way past me so um it's definitely a uh, kind of a like a like a humbling experience to see what these guys go through what's the best part of your 60 meter hurdles race the best part um I think I'm known for my start um people know me as a very explosive uh kind of hurdler um, and I'm known to make out some really good gains in that first that up to hurdle one and then pass it. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say my acceleration to hurdle one. What about the one ten hurdles? Um, 
Yeah, kind of the same. Um, throughout the years, I've struggled towards the end of my race, um, but luckily I found a coach who's been able to fix that. So I'm really <laughs> excited for the outdoor season. I was very excited last year. Didn't get to showcase it, um, but uh, I'd say uh, if you asked me this two years ago, I'd say my start to five. Uh, now, if you ask me this now, I'd say my transitions from five to eight is my strength in the hurdle. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to outdoor now. In my observations, the most sadistic event in track and field is the 400 meter hurdles. You have a PB of 53.2. Are we going to see you compete in that anymore, or is that you going to let that alone for a while? Yeah, that's going to be it. I don't see myself. <laughs> I think you're you're 100 correct. These guys are a little bit crazy, uh, not only due to the 400, but then the add hurdles in there and. I tell you what, hats off to them. I respect it, and I don't think my PR, I'm fine with that, you know. Yeah, no, I think it's totally respectable. I remember watching Ashton Eaton in uh, 14. He had taken the year off the deck, and he was doing the 400 hurdles, and I'm following him. I'm in Glasgow. He runs his PB, and I'm going, why are you doing this event? And he goes, yeah. oh, I'm learning so much about myself, you know. And it's uh, – I've always been fascinated watching the hurdles, the high hurdles, because I just think – Little, just a tiny bit off, and the party's over. And mm -hmm. I remember Aries fall starting in the race before he set the world record. And he told me afterwards, I'm ready now. I said, what do you mean? He says, I got my screw-ups done. Mm -hmm. And David Oliver was like that too. So I'm going to throw some names of hurdlers. And you got three words to describe them, okay? okay. All right, here we go. Aries Merritt. Um, funny, uh, goofy, and um, and the goat. <laughs> Terrence Trammell. Uh, serious, strong, and quick. David Oliver. <laughs> Big, <laughs> goofy, um, and strong, powerful. Freddie Crittenden. Uh, goofy, funny, and he's my friend. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, Orlando Ortega. Orlando Ortega. Um, loud, intimidating, but nice. Okay. What was the biggest impression you had when you competed in Torun in Poland this year? Uh, the biggest impression being like... Um, Crowd, uh, level of competition, yeah. the interest of the poles in track and field. Yeah, that um, I, this is my second time being there, and I think the atmosphere is always wonderful. Um, I love indoors for that reason; it's way more intimate, um, and you know, it was a packed arena, and people came there to to watch a good show. And I was racing uh, Andrew Pazzi, which was oh great. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, on fire, and um, I had kind of lagged a little bit in the season, and that was kind of my my season's best race at the time. So, um, Torun was a, it was a lot of fun in it and it, and it gave the impression again, it's just like, that's a fast track. So you go there, you're going to change your season around. And I think as athletes, we all know which tracks are going to help turn our season around. Sure. Torun was one of those. What about Mondeville? What, what do you, what's like competing indoors in France? Oh gosh, home. I can't like, that just feels so much like home to me. And, yeah. uh, just, I love interacting with the crowd. Uh, they entertain me when I try to speak a little bit of French. You know, they're not rude. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, you suck. Stop trying to talk French. Um, but no, I've I've gone the extra mile to kind of solidify, like, you know, I'm feeling comfortable there. Um, I love the fans. I'll sign every autograph, every kid who comes out to me. I love, you know, interacting with just the people there. And it's the staff, the uh, meet directors, the you know, the people who show you back and forth to sure. the hotel the arena, they're all nice and just all wonderful people. And they've welcomed me with such uh, open arms that uh, like any chance I get, I will always be at Mondeville. And it's, it's like my second home. They know who I am and That's the fans cool. know who I am and they cheer for me. And it's just, I feel, I feel accepted. Um, do you miss teaching school? I do. I do. Um, I've had some really good connections with these high school kids back at, um, in, in Columbia. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's never a, a dull day. I'll tell you that much and dealing with high school kids, they got their yeah. own problems and it's fun interacting and talking with them, um, and, and teaching them, you know, not only educational stuff, but life lessons as well. 
what have you had to teach? Did you teach remotely at all? I haven't taught remotely, no. Okay, okay, okay. I was just curious if how you had experiences with that. Um, what has been the biggest adjustment in training during the pandemic times? Um, I think right now the biggest adjustment was not knowing where we're going to practice next. Okay. Uh, as things were shutting down, uh, we had to change locations. We weren't sure if we were going to get back on the track. So we kind of just had to roll with the punches and um, we lost the weight room that we're able to train at. So it was kind of finding creative ways to stay strong and strength while also, you know, accepting that locations may change. We may not get back on the track. We may not have to, but um, I think we've all handled it really well. So I wouldn't say it's that much of a challenge. Like I said, we're hurdlers. We're easygoing guys. Um, but that's been kind of the, the biggest, you know, obstacle in our life. Do you use kettlebells? Yes, we've got kettlebells and dumbbells, uh, resistant bands, you name it. All the, all the mobile stuff. What is the core exercise that you hate the most? Oh, that I hate the most. Um, I'd either say, because we're doing these a lot, um, I absolutely hate like bicycle crunches. Just okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so, like, you start to get like a pain dead center in your stomach after, you know, 30 seconds and you still got to like twist, twist and bicycle crunches. Um, but those, I just, I, you need them, but uh, I could do without them. <laughs> Is there a workout that you know really shows that you're in shape? Is there a workout that coach gives you that when you do it, you go, I'm ready? Is there a... Yeah, the two. So one is on the track. It's 350s. Okay. If we're running with 350s in a solid time, then I know not only am I like in shape fitness wise, but I've got the endurance to, you know, train extra hard. Um, and then the second is um, the standing 110 hurdle workout. So we'll do a standing fly down to mm -hmm. 110s. Um, and if we're hitting really good numbers on that, and I'm, you know, able to continuously gain momentum towards the end of the uh, the, the hurdles, then I know that I'm I'm ready to go. I recall interviewing Tony Jarrett, Roger Kingdom, and Alan Johnson. It's 1995. I'm in Gothenburg, Sweden, and I'm giving these guys a little bit of crap because they hit in the semis, boom, 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 hit three hurdles in a row, you know, and, and um, Tony was like that, but Roger Kingdom, I mean, he just, he would just like power through them. There was so much speed with those guys and you guys have speed too, but there's finesse as well. And you send, you tend to hit less hurdles. What is that about? Is there more speed now? And you guys now know how to control it? Or how would you describe the era that you're in? Gosh. Um, well, if we're going to compare times back then to today, mm -hmm. recently, I think a lot of those guys were consistently running like 13 O's and 12s. Yes. Uh, yeah. Frequently. So today we've got, you know, we had um, Grant who ran 12. But, you know, that 12 number hasn't been seen as consistently as it has back then. And, and just, I don't know the disconnect um, mm -hmm. from it, um, but a lot of guys are running, you know, they'll run 13 twos, 13 twos, 13 ones. If we're going to run that back then, that's getting us fifth, sixth place, you know, like it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not as impressive. So to say that we're dealing with the speed differently, possibly. Um, uh, yeah, those guys were a lot more aggressive, uh, especially like Roger Kingdom, Alan Johnson was just so fast and so quick. Um, and these guys were able to just kind of run through these hurdles where I, I think today we've got a lot more knowledge about it and coaching. And so some of these styles may have changed up a little bit. The core concepts still remain the same. Um, but um, yeah, I'd, I'd say they're probably doing a little bit of a better job back then than, than we are as a collective, you know, as okay. a whole. On the average. Uh when you, um, if you were not a hurdler and you were 
if you were not a hurdler, mm -hmm. what running event would you do? I think I would do the, I'd lean towards, oh gosh. I can tell you which event I like the most, which is like okay. mobile. I think it looks so much fun. Like that's just so much fun. Oh, would yeah. that be good? Probably not, you know, <laughs> but I think that's the most fun looking event on the track. And they're, those guys have the best photos. Let me tell you. Oh yeah, they do. They, I mean, it's, it's, I, I pull stuff when they did that, those home competitions, you know, and I was trying to pull the stuff off the screen. That was a lot of fun. Um, do you think athletes are drawn to events or you were like drawn to the hurdles? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think maybe it's 50, 50. Cause I think a lot of times some athletes don't have the freedom to choose. Like I, you know, had the, the choice to, mm -hmm. So you know, um, I've worked with some athletes who say they hate the event that they're doing, but their coach said that they'd be better at it, you know, than anything else. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I have to say it's a 50, 50 kind of toss up. And it's, it's a shame because you want the child, you know, or somebody to choose the event that they're, you know, doing um, and not do it because they think they'd be the most successful. At the end of the day, we're trying to have fun um, in the mm -hmm. sport competitive at the same time. So, you know, it's a give and take there, I guess. Were you disappointed about no U S champs this year? Uh, yeah, I was, I think everybody was, um, but in the grand scheme of things, I think it's the right decision. I think our health and the health of, you know, the staff, the, you know, fans who may or may not have been able to show up um, is equally as important. So I think it was definitely the right call. Was I disappointed? Yes. Um, but also if USA champs didn't mean anything, um, if it wasn't for the Olympic team or if it was just a track meet, I, something I could, I could have passed up, which made it a lot easier too. So, yeah. What was your initial feelings when you heard the Olympics were going to be, um, canceled for 2020 and moved to 21. Yeah, first was shocked and surprised. Um, and I think they had said it's never been changed before and, you know, adjusted. And that just kind of shows the situation that we're in if we're able to, or we're changing the Olympic date to something else um, that we're in, you know, a pretty serious situation. So the first thought was like, I'm surprised and shocked. And then it was like, okay, well, this is, this is a big thing and it's affecting everybody. And I think it was eventually the right call. I know they had tried to hold out for as long as they possibly could, but I think um, in the end it was the right decision. And yeah, you can't be saving lives over, you know, some monetary gain. Okay. Um, talk to me about, sorry, someone just, just want to make sure. Oh, just I get people coming up the driveway and okay. just dropping packages off. Um, um, the, are you starting to plan for the 2021 season? Are you like planning indoor events yet or? Yeah, we're, um, because everything is still up in the air, um, we're kind of just taking it day by day. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to prepare as if there is a indoor season. Um, I've got the uh, buy for the next world indoor championships because I won that uh, little grand tour thing. Yeah. Uh, so my goal is on that if it happens um, and being prepared for that. Mm -hmm. um, the indoor season or the track meets in between, we'll see if you know that happens or not. And I think the major goal of any Olympic season is the Olympics. So um, yeah, it'd be nice to kind of run an indoor season, but if that has to get scrapped, you know, and able to have, in order to be able to have the, you know, outdoor season that we need now for the Olympic trials and, and Olympics coming up, then I think that's a sacrifice I'm willing to give up to. Mm -hmm. um you have so when did you begin competing in the hurdles what year uh professionally 2012 13. okay okay so you've been competing at a professional level for eight years will we see you through 2024 uh we'll see <laughs> i think um for me um nearing the end of my career definitely um and like i said i made a change to this coach to kind of go all in and i believe in him and i believe in his philosophy and all the things that he can do um so this is just me really being focused giving 100 percent in and if things pan out the way i'd like to um and i'm able to be competitive in this 
growing competitive, you know, event, um, then I'll stick around for a little bit as long as I can milk out some things. But if not, um, I think I'm satisfied with the accomplishments and achievements that I've done so far. Um, and I can leave the sport saying I've given it all that I, you know, all that I've got and, and be satisfied. Uh, describe for us the, the competition in 2018 in Birmingham at the world indoors. Yeah. Fierce. How did that go for you? Yeah. Yeah, fierce. Um, I was having a tremendous year personally. I had PR once, twice, three times actually indoors. So I was really rolling, a, a, you know, having a good, good momentum going into the world indoor championships. And uh, I just remember looking at all of the fierce competitors, people running seven fours. Uh, it was you know, a handful of guys, so it wasn't like anything was given to me. Um, and I knew that I had to bring my A game for it. And, you know, just lining up to what next to Aries Merritt and uh, Andrew Posey and Milan and um, uh, Manga, you know, French guy, um, and knowing that like any one of these guys can drop seven, three or better or seven, four or better in these in this race, like you're going to have to bring it. So, um, yeah, it was kind of weird too. There was a first a false start on the first gun, um, and brought us all back, and then we went off again. And I, to be honest, I don't really remember the entire. I don't remember anything about the race other than coming off the last hurdle and just leaning and giving it all that I got. And then you got that this like camera. They didn't know who won at first, and then it said Posse beat me out by a hundredth of a second. And then yeah, that was that. Wow. Yeah. Um, the in most of your races do you have memories or is there like a small part of the race you remember like in a in a really big race how how is that or is it, are the indoor races just so darn sharp it's really hard to remember things from it really is it's just like it's bang the gun goes off and then it's over and so a lot of times i quit it to like being on autopilot so okay um, I'm just making sure things don't go wrong and it's I'm pressing the button and then the body does what it does. Um, if I'm remembering something in the 60 meter hurdles, it's probably because I did something wrong. So <laughs> okay. but I, I heard when I got to manually take over um, in the one tens, it's similar, um, but you can kind of feel a little bit of the rhythm more internally. Um, and uh, yeah, if we're doing it right, you kind of don't really have a lot of memories of what's going on. You just, feel it going well if that makes sense when you're doing the indoor hurdles do you um are you telling yourself to stay close to hurdles or anything like that or is it you have practiced this so much you're trying to there's a finesse with it and there's a kind of a self-knowledge that you continue to use yeah 100 percent self-knowledge and, and more so just autopilot Mm -hmm. but like we've trained the situation we've trained for you know a good start a bad start we've trained for fast shuffles in between we've trained for it all so it's really pressing the button is really that simple um and letting your body do what it has to do so hopefully you've done everything you needed to do in practice to make you be prepared um and i've had where i i've been um that practice foundation wasn't as strong, which is why, you know, I've wavered in the race. So mm -hmm. like I said, if practice is, is sharp, then you don't have to think about anything. It's just autopilot. Do you sense when someone is next to you? You do. I, and it's kind of like this weird sixth sense. You get to feel the peripherals of people next to you. Um, um, but a lot of times, that's you breaking focus. So I've had races where I, I can, I'm watching myself and I'm watching, you know, the next lane's over. Um, and then I usually run bad. Um, but the races where it's been a tight race and I'm, I'm so focused that I'm, I'm just looking at the finish line and then I feel people off the last hurdle trying to run in. So that's, I guess when you're doing it right, you feel them at the end of the race when you're running into the line, but not in between. You always teach yourself to lean at the finish? Yeah. Um, a lot of races have been won or lost based on, you know, how aggressive you're running off that last hurdle. Yeah. Uh, I've seen guys in third place off the last hurdle end up winning just because they're wow. 
bringing more momentum and they're really driving and striking and, and leaning as hard as they can. Um, I think a perfect example of that is Dayron Robles and Terrence Trammell at the Underworld Championships and Robles out leaned him, um, which was phenomenal. These guys are in 7-3, but it's just like, like it's that much of a difference, you know, the shoulder lean and, and how fierce you are with it. Mm-hmm. The um, when when you're competing indoors, how many events will you compete in in a a normal season? How many times do you compete indoors? Man, um, that is a a varied question or answer. If we're worried, if we're working on something that you know needs to be fixed up or hashed out, or if there's a, a world indoor championships that I'm trying to focus mm-hmm. on. Um, it could vary from four to five, depending on, you know, what my coach agrees with. Um, I think for me, a lot of times I go into indoors trying to make some money that way. So sure, I like to my indoor season with as many races as possible. And I think I remember one indoor race I ran, gosh, close to eight races, which is crazy. Um, yeah. and you're just running every couple of three days, four days, just going from one town to the next, <laughs> trying to rack up everything. But um, yeah, I think the ideal is close to four to five because at the end of the day, um, indoor isn't the most popular uh, sure. season. Field, it's outdoor. So you don't want to kind of overdo it indoors to where you're feeling gassed and, and can't perform outdoors. What's your typical number of competitions in an outdoor season? Um, outdoor season is a lot longer, so it could span anywhere from April, May, officially, to September. So, gosh, you're three competitions a week. What was that? Uh, 15, 16 competitions it could be, more. That's more a lot. That, you know? Yeah, and by, the, by September, your body's usually shot, um, which... You know, as an American, I think we tend to run early and then taper off at the end. A lot of Europeans have the luxury to start in June <laughs> and then compete from then on. So um, it's a little different when you got to get used to or ready for you at the end of June and be nice and sharp. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it can be a, a lot of races. A hey, final question: Do you have an inspirational quote? or something you think about to kind of get you in the right place? Yeah. Um, I've got a wall of quotes that um, <laughs> I've got on my wall just to, you know, to look at. Uh, but the one that's kind of stuck with me is kind of cheesy. And it's one that I say to like my dad or my family, they know and it's called burn rubber, not your soul. I got that from a, a TV movie or a movie. Uh, it's called biker boys, but <laughs> like I said, it's really cheesy. <laughs> You add That's on cool. to the meeting is just like don't like don't kill yourself don't jeopardize who you are on the track burn the rubber not your soul and uh and go out and have fun so that's uh that's what i like to say well jared eaton thank you so much um it's really been fun talking with you and catching up i'm so happy that you're training well stay safe i look forward to seeing you indoor and outdoor next year and sure. um This is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. Our program is Socialing the Distance. We featured Jared Eaton, the 2016 and 18 U.S. champion, and the silver medalist in the world indoors in 2018. Jared, thanks a lot. Great job. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you. I took it. Cheers. Thank you. Hey, sports fans, it's Larry Eater, Run Blog Run, the program, Socialing the Distance, and today we featured Jared Eaton. He's the 2016 and 2018 USA champion at the 110-meter hurdles. He also was fourth in the World Indoors in 2016, and he took the silver in a photo finish in 2018 in Birmingham, England. Um, Jared's a lot of fun. He's down in Phoenix now, moved from Columbia, South Carolina. Big change. He was a, uh, um, a substitute school teacher, and that's how he's supporting himself because he does not have a sponsor, um, which just blows my mind because Jared's one of the nicest most photogenic and um, thoughtful athletes that I know. And he takes the time to talk to kids, sign autographs, and hang out after a meet. Very, very popular in Europe, and any brand would be lucky to have him. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a kid on the uh, – he's a hurdler on the cusp. He's been an elite athlete, 
since 2012. Uh, went to Syracuse, was a pretty good athlete in high school, played football and track. Track was his fun thing. In college, he focused on track when he got to Syracuse after being in Westchester. And uh, I like him. He's a, he's a good guy. He knows this event. He went to Phoenix to train with Freddie Crittenden and Freddie's coach. And um, he's learning a lot of good things this year. And that's what athletes who are on the cusp need to do. And in a year like this, a strange pandemic year, a year of our modern plague, when the Olympics been moved uh, another year to 2021, and we don't even know if it'll happen then, um, what you should do is take the things that are the weakest in your athletic regimen and improve them. And that's what Jared's doing. Um, uh, I had him talk about some of the top hurdlers and asked him to give me three words to describe him. He uh, liked to use the word goofy on a few. Uh, shocking that he used that on David Oliver. Um, but uh, it's a good group of athletes. I-, I love the hurdlers. You know, they know how to compete. And when they're off the track, they have fun. And that's what it's supposed to be. Uh, and it's a great, uh, um, they're great role models for young people, for fans, and for normal humans, you know. It's okay to compete. It's okay also to respect people who are different than you. And uh, <clears throat> that's our Larry political lesson for the day. Um, but also, so Jarrett has been around for eight years. He's uh, seen some pretty amazing events and he's done well in the world indoors we would love to see him do well outdoors the 110 meter hurdles he's got a pb of 13.25 and uh he's been working on his starts and working on the middle and the finish of his races so we'll see this next year in 2021 what all this great training has wrought and uh, he's staying positive and staying focused Uh, his big change in um moving from uh south carolina to arizona has been the heat. And of course, it's a dry heat, so they have to work out in the mornings. But it's hot as heck. And uh, um, But the training's helping him. They've had a juggle with uh, core, run, core uh, exercises, does kettlebells, also told me about a few of the workouts that um, really tell him that he's on. One is a series of 350-meter runs, which, yeah, I would tell you that you're on. Another one's a uh, standing high hurdles. Um, and, uh, that's gotta be rather difficult too, but Jared is one of those amazing athletes and he's training with, uh, the athletes he's competing against the, the 110 hurdles globally is an incredibly competitive event. It's like the women's hundred hurdles. Uh, and in the U S we've got hurdlers who are fast sprinters and who have finesse. And that's what Ronaldo Nehemiah, the former world record holder and 49er and current uh, manager uh, told me you need to be a great hurdler. Um, Jared has competed against Aries Merritt, David Oliver, Terrence Trammell, Orlando Ortega, Sergey Shabinkov, um, and on Andy Pazzi, Andrew Pazzi, among others. So he's competing against some very, very good athletes. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can do in the next few years. Uh, that'll be a lot of fun. He's a, a, a fine athlete. He's a finer person. And um, let's help find him a sponsor. I think that's important. Anyway, this is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. Uh, if you like Run Blog Run, like is a Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you love us, subscribe on the YouTube. Uh, thanks to Mike Deering with the Shoe Addicts for managing all these wonderful uh, interviews. Uh, Thanks to Mike and Adam for encouraging me to um, take the time to do these interviews. Uh, Thanks to my dear brother, Brian, my partner at Run Blog Run, who's the man who convinced me to get into blogging, the man who convinced me that I need to do these interviews, and um, who encourages me via umbilical cord to continue to grow and to evolve in this lovely sports media. So stay safe. If you're going outside, take your mask with you. Make sure you exercise every day, hydrate, eat well, and get some sleep. If you're going to be inside, always wear a mask. 
don't play around. Um, this is really a pandemic and it doesn't attack your masculinity to wear a mask. It makes you patriotic. And what does patriotic mean? It means you're caring for other people, someone besides yourself, a higher ideal. And there's some people that are more susceptible to getting sick than you. So wear a mask and keep them safe. Keep your family safe as well. All right? And keep a sense of humor, please. Oh, and the final thing, um, vote. I'm not telling people how to vote. I'm telling people to exercise their right to vote. There's been many, many people who've given their lives so you can vote and you can say goofy things, okay? So celebrate their lives and vote. All right. One time. You vote one time, okay? Larry Eater, Run Blog Run, signing off.